welcome to my second podcast, and it is actually a joint one with Mr. P. Price, Merseyside's legendary entertainer. From Radio 1 to Radio City, Julie Walters to Shirley Bassey, the London Palladium to the QE2, a Sony Radio Award to the international acclaimed New York Award of Top Talk Radio Show Host of the Year. Peter's seen and done it all. His career has spanned 50 years, compressing of TV, radio, and his phenomenal success of his own autobiography, P. Price, Name Dropper. Look forward to hearing a bit about that in a moment. But Mr. P. Price is quite simply a talk show legend who has been broadcasting to people across Merseyside for almost 50 years. His late night talk show on Radio City has earned him a phenomenal 29 awards and his biggest accolade being that he was introduced to the Radio Academy Hall of Fame. Now, a few years ago, Pete was made honorary scouser by the city of Liverpool. Can't say I'm jealous about that at all. And more recently, he's been given the city's highest accolade when it comes to recognition as a citizen of honour by the Lord Mayor. Well, Mr. Pete Price, you certainly have had a colourful, longevity, wonderful career. Was that really me? <laughs> Was that? Do you know, sitting here, and I just cannot believe when people say that. Mm. By the way, 30 awards. I've just got a new one. Congratulations. The other day. <laughs> so I'm just, I can't believe that's me. And thank you for inviting me to your ridiculously big home where I've got lost. I've done about 200 steps just finding the toilet. It's, it's crazy. It is a bit excessive, isn't and it? This it is. is a joint venture because you and right. I are going to uh, put it out on your podcast yeah. and my podcast together. You're going to put the film out. I'm yeah. just going to put the audio out. Well, that was it. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, on social media and you were looking for more people to come on your podcast didn't you and i'm number am i number 112 not at all i wanted you i have a list of very <laughs> i've got a hundred no, you've got 111 online yeah, at the I've moment already, yeah you? yeah but i i just i love interviewing people like you because yeah. as you know i've always been a fan and you were very kind to me in the oh. early days when you'd just come out of big brother and you came on the show and i was so overwhelmed <laughs> at interviewing you that you stayed for the three hours i did it and do you great. know what that interview really sticks in my mind because I don't know if you can recap a conversation that we had um, a, a few days, it was either a couple of days or weeks prior and it kind of shocked me a little bit because I wasn't ready for it. You can imagine when I come out of Big Brother, you get kind of in this bubble, you're pulled from pillar to post, you're doing a million and one interviews morning, noon and night. I had an agent, you know, who looked after all that side of things. I had press officers, I had bodyguards, all these people chaperoning me around. So you just wake up in the morning, you have a bit of an itinerary, and I'd do this, that, and the other. And when we first met and we started to work on the pantomime, I don't know if you can recall this conversation, it was uh, in the rehearsals, you said to me something down the lines of um, that you, Radio City, had supported me endless throughout my time in Big Brother. Which and, we and did, I know which that we now. did. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know as much at the yeah. time, yeah. but I certainly know now and I respect it now. And I think it was you or your team in there requested an interview with me and they wanted, whoever it was spoke to, it was probably an agent of them, so wanted some like a ridiculous amount of money. And the conversation you and I had was like, hey, you know, I've interviewed everyone from the Beatles to this, that and the other. We supported you so much and we just thought you'd be straight into the studio mm -hmm. doing an interview with us. And I felt ashamed. I was like, oh, really? And it, it kind of opened up to me like so much mechanics goes on around when you come out of being the winner of the first, you know, reality. Also, you, program, you've never experienced you know? anything like it and it no. was brand new. So there's no reason why mm -hmm. you would know about that. And also agents like yeah. to try and get because they need their cut yes. so they would do that but we backed you because first of all you came over sensationally secondly i want to interview because i had the hots for you i thought you were incredibly attractive <laughs> and he's married now with kids so that's knackered that one up um, you missed out <laughs> but when we did pants on i've got to say this and i've got to say this to camera are you ready <laughs> This man does not only sing out of tune, he actually raps out of tune. Do you know anyone that raps out of tune? But having said that, he was sensational in panto and the public absolutely loved you, Craig. They absolutely well, loved you. But you were, you were human. And no one has ever, in my humble opinion, and it's not because I'm sitting here, sitting here no one has ever topped you on Big Brother, ever to me, oh, ever. That's nice to know, because... Yeah. 
you set the you set the boundaries mm. for Big Brother, and a lot of people go not as good as Craig, not as good, oh, different than Craig, and, nice. and it, it's true. Yeah. But it's true, and you've been the most successful out of it. Mm. But you were successful before, weren't you? Before w- you went Big I Brother, I was quite successful. Yeah, you know, people have said to me, "Oh, you've got your fifteen minutes fame. You've done okay because you won Big Brother." But for me, the whole application of going into Big Brother, I mean. People don't know, but I was shortlisted. or went, went down through 45,000 people applied mm-hmm. for it. And I honestly felt a winner the day I walked in. Not not thinking I was ever going to win the yeah. show in any way, shape or form. But, you know, I come from Liverpool. Didn't have the best education. I can hardly read and write dyslexic. Left school at 15. Never sat a single exam in my life. And then all of a sudden, I, I moved to Shropshire when I was 18. Set up my own building company and... By the time I was 25, I probably topped a million pound turnover. And that was when we had a recession in the mid 90s as well, you know. Went on to employing about 30 staff full time on there and doing everything from plans right through to completion. So I felt like I was was done good. Mm. I was successful in that way. But I believe I would never have got on Big Brother if I hadn't have had that infrastructure beforehand. No, I, I, th- I think you're right. The one question I want to ask you about Big Brother, because I don't want to uh, labour that because yeah. it's, everything's been said. I was offered Big Brother once and never went anywhere with it. Never went anywhere that with it. That was going to be one of my questions well, I was going to ask you. <laughs> never went anywhere near it because one, I picked my nose and I couldn't think of anything worse. A terrible pick of my nose. It's a yeah. form of nerves. I don't know. Yeah. But the question I want to ask you is, you're, you're a, we did panto together, so you're not ashamed of seeing yourself naked or whatever. Yeah. But that, to me, would be the most difficult thing. The idea of toilets, the idea of passing yeah. wind, the idea of picking your nose, the idea of snoring, mm. the idea of masturbation. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's quite intrusive, isn't it? You know, we're all human. We all do all that sort of thing. But when I went into the house, you know, I sat with the producers and directors and they said, you know, We'll have 29 cameras on you, I think, and many others. 29? 29 fixed cameras that are Stop. going to be visible. 29? 29 fixed cameras around the place. And also about another 10 more Roman behind the mirrors, the one-way mirrors. And they explained, you know, because we had to sign into this contract that when you go to the toilet, there will be a camera over the top of your head. So I questioned, I said, is that really necessary? Why would anyone want to see me using the toilet? Because I find a bit... It's distasteful. What type of programme is this? Because remember, no one's seen Big Brother at no, this no. point. So I was quite cautious. And they they assured me, they said, it's for your own safety. The type of pressure you're going to be in, in that environment, if someone got upset or maybe tried to hurt themselves, and we don't want a room or an area that they can go in and harm themselves. So they said, I assure you that none of that content of you using the toilet is going to be shown unless you're in there having a little kiss with somebody, yeah, yeah, then yeah. that's yeah, yeah. part of the programme, you know, but not actually using the toilet on a daily basis. So I said, I trust I trust you're not going to... That's you know, interesting you that. say that, because the people on the other side have got to watch that, because yeah. they've got to go through it. I mean, the idea of somebody mm. watching me wiping yeah. my bottom appalls me beyond yeah. belief. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be nice for anyone. You know what was really strange for me? After coming out to Big Brother, it was about four or five days later, we had a big rap party. And I went and, you know, when Big Brother first started, they only had 35 staff on. By the time the nine weeks it finished, they had over 240 staff. So the party was quite big. I had people coming up to me saying, I Craig, I'm on camera 17. I do a four hour shift when you're asleep that close to your face on a camera. And I would just kind of look at them and think, I don't even know what to say to you, yeah. you know. And then someone else would come up and say, Craig, you had 1,328 cups of tea in your house, everything was clocked and monitored. That what you don't even think that is being monitored and, and, and calculated up is happening behind the scenes. I've got to say thank you to you for Big Brother and I've got to thank Big Brother because doing a late night phone in five nights yeah. a week, four hours a, a night, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because <laughs> everybody wanted to talk about it. Yeah. It was the most amazing uh, story and yeah. the build up to it and everything. Mm. The first one, they'll never top the first one. They'll never, no. whatever they do, even with the celebrities, whatever, Binning they'll gone, never top the first one. It was a piece of history mm. and it was great for me because like Brookside, for instance, when Brookside came, yeah. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because all the stories and the one story of people say, what was Brookside like for you? Max Farnham, when they had the Down syndrome child, yeah. he didn't accept it. The wife did accept it, yeah. and it was that, and people related the same as Big Brother, yeah. and there was so much conversation. It was fascinating, mm-hmm. but I promise you, you were never disliked. 
You were loved all the way through it. Your warmth, and you're still like that. You do a lot of charity work. We meet at a lot of charities. So your warmth still comes over. And that's why you're still where you are and as successful as you are, which is all congratulations to you. Yeah, that's very nice to know that. It was in, um, yeah, that, that, that interview, just going back to what we mentioned earlier, I remember doing hundreds of interviews, morning, noon, and night, right around the country, etc. And then when you asked me to come into the studio, and I said earlier, I was a little bit embarrassed because I didn't realise that you were trying to get me there sooner. Um, as you say, your chat talk show, you went on, I think, three or four hours each night, and I ended up staying the whole duration, wasn't it? And what stuck out to me, and I've said this to many other radio presenters, Chris Moyles being one of them who were become friendly with and interviewed me a lot of the times, you were probably the only ones who didn't have a list of questions, and you would ask me a question, and whatever answer I gave you, and I felt I was probably experienced enough having so many interviews, I think to myself, I can drive it down a path of the things I want to talk about by what answer I give the presenters. And with you, it was the first time where you had really interesting questions, ones I hadn't been asked a million times, and whatever I answered, you sp- instantly thought of another question on top of the back of that. Which is exactly you know, what's happening now. I, I am led I am led by you and I've worked like that. I mean, and also Phil Redmond, who mm-hmm. owned yes. uh, Brookside, said to me he will always let me interview him because I let him talk. Yeah. People don't want to hear me. They want to hear the guest. Yeah. And I love it. I've only had two interviews ever that have been really bad and they were just <laughs> awful. Were One was uh, the Samaritans. It was a lady. We were trying to help the Samaritans. People don't realise it's an organisation that needs all the help in the world financially, mm. uh, but it's always there for people. Mm. And this woman came in and she said to me, and she was horrible. She didn't stay very long in the job. Um, she went to me, uh, before we start, we can't talk about anybody on the show about uh, what happens. I said, well, I realise that, but we can generalise. No, we can't. And also, I don't talk about my private life, so don't ask any questions of me. And I went, would you like to interview me? Because you just completely shut that interview down. I was really cross about that. Really cross. Mm -hmm. And then once when I was live uh, doing an afternoon show, they brought the the guests were coming in every 20 minutes, and this woman sat in front of me, and I had no notes at all, and I hadn't a clue what her name was, or what she was selling. So I had to interview live with half a million listeners, and I bluffed and talked, and eventually got her name, and then she went tablets. Well, you see, the tablets that we're talking about, and it took me 20 minutes to get to the tablets. They were the two worst interviews. Good job you're experienced and be able to pull pull out of that. Bluffer. It's hard to do, isn't it? Well, you mentioned the Samaritans there. One thing that stuck in mind, you know, you, you're super famous for the 40 odd years doing your late night talk show, but you've had some major experiences on there, haven't you? One with a 12 year old boy who... The two, the two main ones were... His yeah, own life, wasn't yeah. The two main mm. ones was when I broke the story about James Bulger. Yes. Um, and his grandma rang me, um, Helen, and that's uh, Ralph's mother. And I, I still get upset over this. All these years later, she came on the show and she said, he'd gone missing, nobody knew what was going on. And she said, I don't think I'm ever gonna see that angel again. Oh. That, that message mm. went round the world. And then when the story unfolded and what the public didn't know was we in the newsroom knew what had happened to him, mm. which was horrific, Tremendous. unbelievable torture. Mm. And we had to keep that to ourselves because we didn't want people to know. And this is a long story, very short. I became the voice for Liverpool of every world newscast from Australia to America, CBN, and it's unbelievable. And I hadn't had the training for something like this in any shape or form, but I had the passion because what I kept saying was, it isn't Liverpool, this could happen anywhere. And of course the story unfolded. And a long story short, I became friends with Denise. I went on the march to keep Venables and Thompson in prison. Mm. And she's very important in my life. And I'm sad that we're friends through Through such a horrific Mm. murder. That was one story. And the other story was a 12 year old boy called Michael and Michael had rung my show, and Michael didn't sound like a 12-year-old boy. He sounded like a 10-year-old boy. He, was very, he sounded very young. Mm. And he'd rung a few times, and he was, 
I don't know, I didn't know whether he was crying wolf or what was going on. But anyway, he said he'd had enough and he was going to commit suicide. A long, long conversation. And I kept him on the phone and I made the decision because I've been doing it for a long time. Just live, mm. live on air. I made the decision because I couldn't put the phone down. If I put the phone down on a 12 year old boy and he had committed suicide, my career would be finished. Mm. My career would be finished. You'd have to but live also, with that and I couldn't live with it anyway because I sensed, because I am a people person, mm. because I've worked as a comic <clears throat> on stage, I know people because I've done what I've done and mm. I've been in the business 50 years. So I said to him, if I come and see you, uh, would you um, not kill yourself? And he said, you wouldn't come and see me. I said, I'll walk out of the show. And what I did and what he didn't know was that I set the police up uh, because it was near Everton. He was going to hang himself from a tree. And it was near Everton. And I got the taxi drivers because Liverpool's not a city. It's a village. Everyone knows everyone. And people knew my trauma yeah. and what was going on. So taxis were in place. and Because I don't know if I was being set up. You know, you know, yeah, I'm an older yeah. man. I don't know if a kid's mm. setting me up. Anyway, I went and I saved him and I stopped him killing himself. And uh, then I took him to the hospital. Um, and the next day, um, the story went round the world. Last night, a DJ saved my life, which, of course, I didn't do it for that. Mm. But it went worldwide, that story. Yeah. <clears throat> Liverpool being Liverpool, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> sense of humour in Liverpool I love can you imagine Michael I've just saved his life he's there the police ring me while I'm driving and I pick yeah. the phone up to see and they're just seeing if I'm alright and then Michael said to me excuse me it's illegal to use your phone when you're driving I went I've just saved your life you little so and so oh that's all he was concerned about Liverpool <laughs> no it was his sense of humour mm -hmm. so those were the yeah. two stories two of many yeah. many we, we had another guy who was actually on the phone on a three-way conversation and he died on air. And it, when you listen back to the tape, you hear him die. And the police wouldn't go and check it out. And I went again. Did you? We kicked his a taxi driver, knew where he lived, knew who he was, kicked the door down and he was dead with the phone in his hand in his house. It was under. So there's so many, yeah. many, many mm. stories about that. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, let me ask you a question. Could you just well, ask I, me I a very powerful say, one? How, how do you cope with that? Because that's a lot of pressure put on you, not just about the individual and that I circumstances. Coped. I haven't coped. Because the aftermath yeah. of that, when I, you go I, home and you're sitting in on well, your own no, and you're trying to process that. I haven't coped. I mean, I have never had counselling in my life. I mean, mm. I'm a patron of Clare House. Yes. The girls that work in Clare House and the boys uh, get counselling. Mm. When you're in Samaritans, you get counselled after think, five hours. Yes. I've never had counselling mm. in my life. I have been a priest in a confessional box mm. five nights a week for yeah. over 40 years. Yeah. And it's been horrendous. Have you ever wanted to go down the radio? Um, um, not so much the, the, the radio route. No, no. Um, I've kind of enjoyed my time on the radio. I thought, well, I always used to think to myself, when I get booked in and do various things, I always used to think TV was a little bit harder. <laughs> not trying to dish it in any way because... I used to think because you've got the cameras looking at you, it added that little bit of extra pressure. So when I finished doing a TV, let's say a series, and I was going on radio stations to promote it, I felt a bit more relaxed then so I could have a bit more fun and a laugh on it all. Not necessarily saying it was easier, but I've never had the opportunity to ask to work on radio in any way. Um, I, cause my kind of trade really is with my hands, isn't it? It's building and construction mm -hmm. side of things. So I think visually wise, it would work more than than actual radio. I don't know, what do you think? After after Big Brother, was there any time you wanted to scream with the fame? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. i tell you what I experienced, and I don't really talk about this is, is very often at all, um, because I'm not a lonely person, but I felt loneliness. Because what was strange was before I went in the house, I run a busy building company, I had lots of good friends, appeared in Liverpool and in Shropshire, and a busy social life. So I was never lonely. I was never on my own. I went into the Big Brother house. I came out and the whole country knew my name. And it was a weird feeling of everybody knowing you. Me being chaperoned around by a, a crew of people, taking me to book signings, taking me to this, taking me to that. Everyone screaming, knowing your name with banners and things. It never felt so lonely. It was a weird, weird um, experience that, that caught me off guard. How long did it take you to come through that? 
Um, only a couple of months, really. You know, only only a couple of months because I used to try to process it. That you know, one morning I would be going and you know name dropping a little bit here. I'll go and have dinner with Victorian David Beckham, and they'd be giving me money for Joanne Harris's appeal. And I come away and I get in the car, being chauffeur driven, and thinking to myself. Has that really just happened? If they just asked me that and the things we talked about and then before I could even process that, I'd go on another something else with somebody else super, super famous, you know, and they knew all about me and knew my name. But it was a weird thing. I felt very lonely on my own. And in the end, I ended up getting one of my friends to pack your job in. Come and, and be and my PA. Yeah. Just you don't. Yeah. It didn't need a PA because the agents had all them running around doing everything for you. But I just wanted the company. So I was kind of paying one of my best mates. No, but you to needed somebody be... to, who, who knew who you were. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell you what I love when you just said that about uh, Beckham. I, in all the years, and I've worked mm. with some of the most famous people in the world, have never taken it for granted. Mm. I also, when yeah. I was out with Bob Monkhouse in Barbados, yeah. I used to pinch myself saying, I'm yeah. sitting opposite Bob Monkhouse. Yeah. So I love yeah, you for that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I will yeah. never, yeah. ever, I mean, I bumped into Barbara, mind you, I made a total show of myself. I bumped into Barbara Streisand, who's my hero, oh, beyond Streisand, belief, wow. in America. And they had to carry me off I just didn't know. I went, I went like a raving batshi. They went, come away. It doesn't, doesn't come much bigger though, does it? It does but, not come much bigger. The point bigger. I want to make is yeah. I love the way you just threw that away about Beckham. Yeah. It's not a name dropper. You mm. are in the position and yeah, you have yeah, been in yeah. that position well, to do that. When I was, when it comes to write my autobiography, and I want to pick up on yours as well in a moment, but... Um, I was writing about some of the weird and wonderful things that had happened to me and you had support from the, the, the publishers, etc. And they were stopping me saying, Craig, you can't say that. You, you'll get sued. And I was a bit like, yeah. I, no, that happened. They, they generally said that. And one of the things, and I'll say it now because we got Victoria Beckham's team signed it off for us, you know. And Victoria, may have had a few drinks or whatever on the night. She's sitting there with her mum, his sister, and David, and she said to me, Craig, if I wasn't married to David, the last night of Big Brother, I would have proposed to you. And I was wow. like, wow, that's kind of quite flattering, isn't it? You know, um, I didn't really fancy her or anything, but it was still flattering. It was, oh, you know, yeah. a spike scale sort of thing. So I mentioned that in my biography and they were like, Craig, you can't put that, that'll cause roots. And I was like, no, seriously, it happened. And they were like, well, if you insist, we've got to get it signed off. And sure enough, they sent it to her and she was like, yeah, I remember that that's night. It. So we had some nice photographs, yeah. we used them and things you know, in our biography. But you, know, you mentioned a moment ago about you've never had any any um, uh, psychiatrist or anything like that, you know, kind of help you in any way of some of the trauma and things you've gone through. Me neither, except we were assigned with, uh, they, they had a psychoanalyzer who spoke to the people before they went in Big Brother. So when we shortlisted down for 45,000, when we got down to maybe the last 30 or 40, then it was getting real intense then in the interviews, you know, screen checks, police checks, psychiatric screen and medical checks. And this gentleman, Brett Carr, was the psychoanalyzer who watches over the program, seeing if you're all okay, who interviewed me for hours beforehand. So when I came out of Big Brother, they said, we've got to assign him. He's got to speak to you once a yeah, week yeah. to see if you're taking it well, you know. And I found, um, I found I didn't need anyone to talk to. I felt that loneliness, but you know, I could phone my friends and have a chat about it. And it did go off a month, six weeks later, but he wanted to talk to me week in, week out. And all I found from him was he was kind of draw out the, the past in you, you know, what happened in your childhood. I lost my dad at a young age. That's obviously traumatic. And he was kind of making me down in a way. So in the end, I, I think I probably had about seven or eight, uh, let's say sessions. hours or sessions with him, would you call it, over a couple of months period. And in the end, he was, I was having the time of my life with what was going on. And I'd be thinking, oh, I'm dreading going to see him now. Yeah. Is he going to bring me down and kind of... I'll tell you why that happened. Yeah. Uh, it happened for a reason. Mm. But unfortunately, you're... Well, not unfortunately. Fortunately, you're a very clever, shrewd man who had a business before. Yes. So you know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think of Big Brother and you now look at reality TV shows, mm. there are so many screwed up people yes. because they're picked up and spat out. Yeah. 
yeah. and they don't get the help. They get a yeah. little bit of help. You were from mm. the early days. I think it's disgraceful what goes yeah. on now. And they are so up their own backsides. Yeah. They've had one hour on television and they think they're stars. And unfortunately, mm. telly is watered down. What they don't understand is when you were on Big Brother, that was the world talking about it. Mm. Now all the TVs have watered down to what yeah. you have. So you were, you know, yeah. very clever in that. So that's why they had to look after you. Do you miss the fame? You've got fame now, but do um, you miss that intense fame? No, not at all. That, that when a first come out was quite terrifying, quite intimidating to a degree. Yes, we had some great times and fun, but it got overpowering. It got quite exhausting. One, because you know yourself, Peter, people, if you're a, a, a chattable person, easy approach like you and I are, people can drain your energy if you're not careful. And I was busy doing my building side of things, doing my property side of things, trying to maintain and build a media career, racing around the country, staying in hundreds of hotels, doing makeover shows, so I was exhausted. And you would drive, you know, changing hotel every night, you would drive to service stations, four hours that way you get stopped, more and more people around you, you know, and it was nice, it was flattering, but after six months, after 12 months, it become exhausting. And what I found was, if I didn't cut the conversation, they wouldn't. Yeah. They would just take, take, take. Am I right in assuming that it was it was it 2001, was it? 2000, first one. 2000, yeah. right. Am I right in assuming that social media wasn't that big? Not it Could wasn't you there. imagine? So it wasn't 22 there at years all. ago. No, wow. no, it wasn't there at all. I think so could you imagine? Could you imagine now what if it, it was be? the first ever yes. Big Brother? Oh. If well, you were destroyed then if, because of that, yeah, could yeah. you imagine now? That, that's right, and if you, you put things into perspective, I, I started social media now quite late, so we've got tens of thousands of followers, not millions of followers like you do when you're on the Love Island, them type of things they come out with. But on that last night of Big Brother, um, this got me in the Guinness Book of World Records, I got 3.7 million phone call votes on the last night of Big Brother, and it cost everyone 25 pence to vote. I, I had dinner with uh, Cherie, well, Cherie Booth opened my, my construction academy, and she said to me, she said, you had more votes throughout the duration of Big Brother than the last general election. Bearing in mind, Tony Blair was in power at that point, her husband, and she said you had more votes. So if you kind of think, that last night of Big Brother, if someone picked up the phone and dialed and spent 25 pence wanting me to win a particular program, they would have followed me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all the usual things, but none of them were there at all. In the early days, mm -hmm. before you went in Big Brother, when you were ready to go, mm -hmm. did you have any idea it was going to be this big? Absolutely not. Hand on heart. And what I can honestly say, Peter, as well, is I never, ever wanted the fame or to work on TV. Don't get me wrong, I've worked hard at it to maintain it. So you it. didn't want the fame? I did not want so the fame So why did you go in? I was going in the right direction with my building company and I was enjoying what I was doing. I still love doing building now. Um, but I was helping a young lady, Joan Harris. She was the Down syndrome, Down syndrome girl from Shropshire. So you went and on for the money? I went on for the money to help her. Yeah, we'd been trying to take her to America for a heart and lung transplant. They wouldn't operate in the UK here on the NHS, sadly. And um, we needed a quarter of a million pounds and we did all the usual stunts trying to save the money and we were getting nowhere. As the months went by, we were saving a few thousand here and there, price of the operation was going up. So I thought I've got to do something dramatic. And then I seen a documentary in Holland about Big Brother and it was saying that this programme could be coming to England and if it's successful, it'll go worldwide and they'd be looking for 10 candidates who will live together, have no connections and will be put in a purposely built house. So I thought, I can do that. That's easy. I generally thought, that is easy. I was wrong, obviously. So I wrote off to the production company, sent this letter, and I forgot about it. I didn't even have emails in them days. Handwritten letter sent off. And I was up on a roof doing some lead flashing around a chimney breast. And the phone as you do. phones were this as big, you, you know, at that point. As you do, as you do yeah. <laughs> and the phone rings me, and it's a lady, a producer says, oh, hi, Craig, this is so-and-so from Endemol Productions. Basil Productions, I think it was. Basil part of Endemol. Uh, blah, blah, big brother. And I was like, what? I, I don't know what. And I generally didn't know what she was talking about. I forgot it was six months yeah, prior. Yeah. And she said, you, you sent a letter in saying, consider me as an applicant in the show. I went, oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it kind of went on from there, really. But going back to when I finally was the build-up to going in the programme, 
I generally thought, if I get on, I probably won't win. But if I get a little bit of publicity and get a bit more money for Joanne, that might create so that a bit was, of a that snowball. Was the logic so it, that yeah. was the logic yeah. behind it. And I generally thought, if I go in the show, whether I come out after two weeks or nine weeks, be straight back in the building site Monday morning, and hopefully a newspaper or a magazine will want as to short as me. That. Short as that. Little did yeah. I know. I would be on, and one thing that haunts me, stuck in my mind, talking about Brett Carr, that psychoanalyzer. When I come out of the Big Brother house, and my nurse, Stephen Maddock, was one of the ones who came to the hotel room with me, um, Brett Carr said to me, sat me down, and it was mayhem, took out of the house, couldn't get to see me family and friends, it was just an explosion, terrifying. Bodyguards whooped me into their police escort, taken away, I felt like I was being kidnapped. No one around me. And Plus you'd you live with those people. Yeah, yeah. Plus you'd live with I've those people. And, and they'd really been taken off you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden I raced away, took to this big hotel, all these people there. And Brett Carr's words were to me. He said, Craig, you will be on the front page of every national newspaper tomorrow. You'll be on every radio bulletin. You'll be on every television news. You'll be the most talked about person in Britain. I get, I get goose pimples in my arms. Because how do you take that? Yeah. You know, who, someone who didn't want to be famous, yeah, yeah. went on a show, I sat on the couch every night with Big Brother thinking, how on earth can you make a TV show out of this? This is a load yeah. of crap. I generally thought yeah, it was yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Little, you know, did I know about production in them days? How long did it take you to forget the cameras? Or did you never forget the no, cameras? No, I've seen other people being interviewed and they've said, oh, you just forget about the cameras. They've got a bit pissed up and they've done something stupid. Well, a lot of them have done something stupid in there. I'm sorry. You don't forget about the cameras. You can vis visually see them. You can hear them. There's cameramen behind a big one-way mirror. They're coughing, they're spluttering, they're pulling cables, they're, you know, dropping so stuff. It's there, yeah. it's there. You don't forget that they're there. I want to ask you, you mentioned earlier about you were asked to go on Big Brother and you wouldn't do it. Yeah. Would you have done it in the early days? No. Not in the no. very, very first no, show? No, seriously. It's, it's the one show I, I could... Nothing like that I could do. Okay. Um, I think I'd be claustrophobic in the room. Mm. Um, no, I genuine, because people say, ah, you wouldn't turn it down. I did, you know. Yeah. They asked me... I, well, no, they didn't ask me. I was lying then. They hinted at me going in the jungle. Oh, right. No way on this earth would you get me in a jungle with snakes and I had the most dreadful experience in Belize in okay. Central America for the army and that <laughs> put me off. I can't even watch. I can't even watch the okay. jungle. Can't you watch it. No, no, no. It's put you off. So no. what happened in Belize? <laughs> I've worked for the army for many yeah. years. Is that and, BFBS? Uh, say again? BFBS, British Forces Broadcasting Yes. Services. No, sorry. no, sorry. No, no, no. Um, um, I forgot what it's called. Um, it, no, the entertainment side as mm. a comic, not for... Uh, okay. So as a comic. So yeah. I'd go out with shows. I went to uh, f um, the Falklands just after the war, yeah, which is too. another story. Yeah. Well, not just after the war, no, no, but yeah. But you know what it's mm. like. Sensational. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, never yeah. forget that. Yeah. But Belize, a long story very short, which is what I say all the time, by the way. <laughs> long story very short. Picture this. So I'm with three girls, mm. dancing girls, I'm with a, a ventriloquist who has a monkey. So he makes the monkey talk. Now the Is local, this TV friendly? The <laughs> local, no, 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 no. The locals in Belize wanted to kill the monkey because they've never seen a talking monkey. It, it was the scariest time of my life. Shit. So we go into the jungle, into Salamanca. So we're in the jungle. They've cleared the space. They've got two tanks with the lights on. So they're the lights. We've got the Scots Guards and we've got the Gurkhas, yeah. who I fell in love with the Gurkhas. Yeah. What a lovely group of people. Yeah. I love them. So there we are. We've got the guy with the Leslie, which is the organ, and he's playing the organ. I am the compere. The girls are ready. We've got the ventriloquist. We've got a singer. That's it. As I'm working, I had long hair at the time. As I'm working, <laughs> well, no, it's important that. As I'm working... <laughs> Something flies at me, and it's a bat, oh. and the bat gets stuck in my hair, and I am hysterical, beyond, you couldn't oh. make up what I was doing, yeah. and the soldiers thought it was the funniest thing they, they ever thought. <laughs> what I didn't know was that the organist was frozen, frozen like that, because there was a tarantula on his organ, and the bat was after the tarantula. So I've got the bat in my hair. He's got the tarantula on the organ. <laughs> I am in a terrible state. Eventually, 
they get me off the stage and I'm in I, I can't tell you the stage event and everyone thinks oh, it's hysterical. Yeah, they Show carries it, yeah. on. Blah, blah, blah. I'm now in a missing hut being calmed down. A huge <laughs> missing hut. And all I can hear is... I said, what's that? Rats. Rats. Oh, There's hundreds. God, yeah, bigger rats. than cats. So eventually oh, they took me back God. to Belize City, which mm. is the arsehole of the world. Is it? I've uh, never been. Dogs of War was made there. Yes, and that was yeah. the capital. Mm. So I'm calming down. I decide to have a shave and the plug gets lifted up by this oh. beetle inside while I'm oh. in a dreadful state. They then said, you need some R&R. &R. So they sent me to an island. Now I can ski. Uh, ski. I was yeah. going to say ski then. Ski. Yeah. So I'm skiing yeah. behind a boat, yeah. a gunboat. Water skiing, so, not, water not skiing. snow yeah. skiing. Yeah. And I'm saying, you're going too fast. Slow down fast. And they went behind, behind. And there was a oh, shoal of barracuda. No, barracuda. barracuda. I was running on the ski past the boat. <laughs> I came home. That was my, and that's a very short version of and it. And you've not been back since, I take it. Yeah, and I yeah. ain't going in the jungle. I'll, I'll cross it off my holiday list. <laughs> but you sound like you've had some wild and amazing experience from them. Is there any highlights of the, of the most amazing times? That you can it's the most difficult career. thing in the world to say mm. because I've been around the world twice. Mm. I've worked on the ships. I've worked everywhere. I've done everything. I've made, yeah. but nobody's given me anything. I've got mm. a little bit of money. Nobody's given me a penny. Mm. I've earned every single penny of it. It's Paid good. my taxes, worked hard, but I've enjoyed every single moment of my life. Did your life change when you met your wife? Uh, yes, it did, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of quite contentment, I think, in my life. You know, I was... Well, I didn't meet Laura till, what was I, about 45 years of age. So, you know, I kind of had many, many girlfriends. Oh, sounds terrible, doesn't it? Beforehand, uh, met some, you know, great girls, lovely girls, um, who probably would have made wonderful wives, but I, it wasn't right for me at the time in my life. I always knew I wanted to have kids, but it just wasn't the right time. And I got to probably a tipping point, probably 44, 45 in my life, and I thought... I probably do need to settle down. I've wanted to. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong, I've wanted to. Uh, and then I met Laura in the green room of um, a television uh, studio. I was a regular there doing bits on TV. Laura was a guest on there doing some bits on TV. And uh, we were both in the green room. And I think my first line, I asked her, does she want some chicken? She was sitting there all on her own, looking like she needed feeding it up a little bit. And I had a box of chicken, offered her some chicken. And then it was... Um, yeah, we just got on great. We chatted for hours because you're there in the green room, you do. Uh, we kept in touch. I asked her out. She said no. Uh, and then our first... Well, we still actually haven't been on a first date yet. Because what <laughs> happened... What happened was... Um, Laura's into her fitness, and uh, I used to be. Anyway, I was had booked in one of these Total Warriors, you know, these Tough Mudder things. Oh, yeah. Have you yeah, seen yeah. them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we kept in touch. What was happening was when I was driving to... Uh, I do all my driving of a night time, working of a day, and whatever we're doing the next day, I could be a four-hour drive to a hotel. So I'd all be driving in the evening when there's no traffic. So I'd ring Laura, and we, we were spending three or four hours on the phone, mm -hmm. you know, driving to location. So I asked her if she wanted to come along. So she came along. So it wasn't a date, because she knocked me back for a date. It was just to come along on this. And I was going with a couple of other mates of mine, and she was like, yeah, I'll join, join in and things. She turns up, and she's got this scarf, fresh scarf, bandages and things on all across there where she'd had a snowboard accident, metal plate, and this, that, and the other. I was like, you wouldn't really be able to do half of these things. They're kind of military-style, you know, uh, assault courses and running for miles. She was like, I'll be fine, I'm tough, you know. She was like, I could bench press you. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, she did it, and we went around the course. And then, um, we, you know, four hours later, we're full of mud. We're all getting washed in the back of our van, trying to clean ourselves down. And we came back here to, not far away from here in Rain Hill, and then Laura ended up staying over having dinner. She stayed the night at my house and <laughs> she ate the this. rest of the history. She's never left. No. She's never actually wow. never spent. She wow. bought a house that week and never spent a night in her house. Wow. She literally wouldn't say moved in with me, but we just spent morning, noon, and night. I went to my work, she'd done hers, yeah. followed around a few weeks later. And literally after about a week or two, I said to her, I think I'm going to marry you after about a week or two. So if you'd have met her earlier, mm. it wouldn't have worked. You weren't right. 
Tough question. Would I have settled down if I'd have met Laura earlier? Could have been a week earlier, could have been 10 years earlier. I don't really know because I was so engrossed in trying to maintain the building side of things that I had, I'd built up and you know loved and was doing the right direction. I was trying to build up a property portfolio, which took up a lot of time. And then the media saying the thing was new for me. So I was learning so much from it and I kind of was liking it. And I thought, I want to keep in this career the best I can. But one thing that stuck in my mind was I was at the Royal Albert Hall and uh, I was getting an award for, I think it was the best pre-recorded moments of the year, best live moments of the year, giving John Harrison thing. And I was going downstage with Barbara Windsor. And I remember sitting in this, this changing room, getting makeup on my face with Cliff Richards there. He's getting his makeup on. And I'd already spoke to Barbara and Barbara brings in Lulu. So now I'm sitting in a room, Peter, no bigger than this bar with these three iconic legends, you know, who have all seen it all before, been there, done that, etc. All giving me some great advice. And one thing Barbara said to me, she said to me, Craig, TV is a fantastic industry to be in when you don't need it. But when you need it and oh, start yes. relying on it, it can be yeah. ugly then, you know, it can be it's dangerous. It, yeah. And that really yeah. stuck in my mind. Many little things over the years, just the odd one-liners have just stuck in my mind. And I, I, I've recapped it many a times down the years. So for me, I was just thinking business-wise, try and build up the media. You know, it can all end tomorrow, but just to work hard at it, try and do what you can, try and learn more things. Like, you know, I learned from you in pantomime and on radio side of things, trying to learn on the cameras and trying to do all my profession in it. And then when I didn't have a TV show, panic sets in a little bit because you do a series for 16 weeks on the BBC and then all of a sudden it ends and you kind of think, is that going to get recommissioned again? Oh, well, you'll know in a month. It's recommissioned, but it doesn't start for three months. Yeah. Shit, what am I going to do for three months, you know? So I'm straight to the auction, buy a derelict house, jump on the tools, you know, knocking it around, think, well, that'll be my retirement plan. That's my backup plan. So these little things that people said to me just enforced me yeah. to maintain this career. But so that's make, that makes I you who ready you, to yeah, settle that, down. All that think, makes you who you are. So it was ready to settle down when you settled down. Now, mm -hmm. now you mentioned three names there. Barbara. Yeah. I met her at the Royal Court. And oh, in fell in love with her straight away. Yeah. And she was uh, starring at the Royal Court in Panto. We became... Great, great mates, and I'm great oh, mates wow. with Scott and everything. Mm -hmm. Cliff Richard. Yes. You said Cliff Richards. Oh, when Cliff I Richard, first yes, interviewed him, yeah. put me in my place. My name is Richard, not Richards. So every time anyone says Richard, I always say Cliff I, if you're watching. I always, <laughs> think, I always think of that, which is great. But all those, mm -hmm. and when she said about television, mm -hmm. now at my stage in life, because mm -hmm. I've never been a big television person, I've never, I had a TV series yeah. which was written uh, called The Comedy Connection by Bob Monkhouse, mm -hmm. and it was cancelled. And I could have, uh, without being dramatic, I could have topped myself. I could have, because we had, they cancelled it Christmas Eve, we had a year's work tied into it, and it was all cancelled. And I thought it was the end of the world. Now I'm older, the point I wanted to make, now I'm older, I'm getting Sky News, I'm doing GB yep. News, I'm doing Jeremy Vine, and I don't need it now. No. And it's easier yeah. when you don't need it. Yeah. And if they cancel it, you go, ah, oh. anyway, how are you? Yeah. It's that. Exactly, but in yeah. those yeah. days, that one TV series, our, our world fell apart. Yes. And people don't understand. <clears throat> now, I always laugh at this. I've been on six this is your life. Six. Never been seen once. I've been on the cutting room floor. I've seen me finger once doing that. And that was it. But that's the cruelty yeah. of television. It's it's and brutal. as you just said, you mm. get a series, you go, is it going to be recommissioned? Mm. And it might be a new boss that comes yeah. in and just doesn't like what you do. Forget the fact it's fantastic ratings. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes me angry. So all those bits of advice mm. and meeting Laura when you met Laura, yeah. it's all fitted in. Yeah, it's how everything's in line, doesn't it, in there? Yeah, yeah. So is it something you've always wanted to do, the TV? As I wanted to, to do radio. a lot more TV. You have, uh, yeah. I wanted to do a lot more TV, but now looking back at my life, I'm delighted mm. of the fame I had. I wouldn't want to be a world star. I really yes. wouldn't want to be. Mm. I love it because I have a life. Uh, yeah. I have lots and lots of lovely friends. Yeah. I am incredibly private with my life. Mm. Although I've yeah. been open on radio yeah. four nights, five nights a week, four hours a night. Mm -hmm. 
there is a private side to me that I keep very private and I'm precious about my friends and I, I, I love my friends and I love my home. Yeah. So I am delighted now looking back, I wouldn't have wanted to be that fame, mm. the cliff, the, yeah. those sort of, plus I haven't got that talent. I've been a bluffer for many years. One day somebody's <laughs> gonna find me out. If you haven't already, talking of talent, you are multi-talented. I actually was quite surprised to find when I was doing some Googling on you yesterday, you've got a CD and you sing quite a, well, I've, I've, Yeah, I've had a couple of, uh, in fact, the older I get, the better my voice gets, I don't know why, because <laughs> I do these shows at the Royal mm. Court, uh, P. Price Holds Court, which sell mm. out every time. I believe so. And yeah. uh, I really love them because it's old fashioned cabaret, yeah. simple as that. So, yes, I had a uh, CD out. I was mm. in the church choir for years. Mm. I've always sang in my act. And in fact, I was the first ever singer at the m and Arena, which is, uh, was the Echo, was the Echo Arena, Arena yeah. and um, I sang You'll Never Walk Alone. So, there Amazing. we are. I bet you haven't. Well, oh, you don't. said that. I don't. Got, I got really, really honoured. I was asked, and I don't know why I got asked, to host the 50th anniversary of the Beatles on oh, there. Wow. And it was the, the arena had only been opened that, first, that year, I think. And um, full house, ten or 12,000 people in there. And what they've done is they brought in a lot of Liverpool artists, all, all doing yeah, Beatles yeah. songs, etc. And Mike McCartney was there, of course, Paul's brother and various things, and Jerry Marsden. So the last song of it all was Jerry Marsden comes on scene, he'll never walk alone. And uh, I'd met Jerry a, a few times, and he'd sung it. They brought on all the house lights, and I'm standing at the side of the stage, and he calls me on. So I went on. Starts to sing with him. Then Ray Quinn come on, and it just kept, was a free for all. Then Everyone. every ba every wow. member who'd been on and sung all come down and carried on singing. But so what you've a sung. feeling it you've is sung. to sing there. You'll never walk alone with Jerry. Never Marston. walk alone. Yes, I, yeah. I miss Jerry so much. I know, the first person. time I, mean, I was a fan uh, because I grew up with the Mersey Beat days, yeah. and Jerry was bigger than the Beatles. Make no mistake, he was Knocked bigger the than the Beatles. Off, didn't he? Number one, he was amazing. And the first time I ever worked with him mm. was. It's not there anymore. The Cemetery Club in Barrow of Furness. The oh Cemetery Club. What a name for a club. And I always remember... People are dying to get in yeah, there. He, he's doing gags now. Uh, he was short and I'm short. Yeah. And there was a thing on the... Uh, Please stop going onto the stage because you have to go onto this oh. low beam. And the both of us banged our heads. Both of us. But I, I miss Jerry. And mm. the last time I saw Jerry... And it upset me. I'm so thrilled I was there mm. uh, at Anfield when Take That brought him on. And oh. Gary's, oh, Gary Barlow, I've always loved, but he brought him down because Jerry was struggling on his pins. Yep. Je brought him down, and Jerry stood at the side and went, You're the star get to the front and that, and I've got the video on my on my phone, I watch it all the time. And what I miss most about Jerry is his wicked, very rude sense of humor. Yep. He was very rude to me. I've got some messages <laughs> on me. I would never even pay him to Paul and his wife. Love him, miss him so much. He is a lovely chap, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. I last seen him when he was looking quite fail. I think um, uh, Steve Rotherham and Sandra uh, renewed their wedding vows and I got invited today. And yeah, Jeremy yeah, was, was struggling yeah. a little bit then. But, but a great man. Great lovely, man. lovely man. Do you know what? This is ridiculous. We could talk all day. I know. I think we could talk all month. You You're an interesting man. You see, there's so many people in there. Um, uh, uh, I've forgotten what it's called now. What, what's it called? Big Brother, not Big Brother. Um, um, the reality. Reality, reality yeah. yeah. <clears throat> You're such a nice man, you see. There's so many boring people in reality TV <laughs> that honestly can't talk. How am I looking? How's the camera? Yeah, How's the everything? Right. You know? Well, let's talk. Forget the camera. We should do this again, you know? I think we should, yeah. Because honestly, we could talk for weeks. I'll tell you what, let's finish. Mm. Your advice to people out there who want to go into the entertainment industry. One bit of advice. Yeah, people have, have stopped me in the street and said, I've applied for Big Brother Craig, you know, what advice would you give me? And I always say to people, you need a backup plan because I've seen thousands come on reality TV in the last 20 odd years and pretty much thousands of them have had their 15 minutes of fame and then failed. And what they do is they struggle going back to their daytime job. You know, they really struggle adapting back into that when they've had a little taste of the limelight. So obviously pursue your dreams. I've never deny anyone from trying to pursue their dreams if they want to work in the media industry but just be aware it is very hard it's cutthroat 
There is a real deep, ugly, dark side to it. Um, but if it's exactly what you want, have a backup plan and don't give up on the first hurdle. Keep working towards that. You might have to fall out on your backup plan for a couple of stepping stones, but eventually, if you're really hungry for it and you've got the, let's say, the talent, the X factor or something, because I think you need a little bit something about you now to stand out to actually get you to that end run. I've got a smile on my face because my mum said to me, have a backup plan. So I went into the catering industry and I went into hairdressing. There's two other stories, but I had a backup plan. And mm. then I found out I could do a job without smelling your chips. And I never looked back, but I had <laughs> a backup plan. Craig, you're a joy to talk to. My pleasure. Thank you very much for coming and joining us, Peter. It's been great. Till next time. Till next time. <laughs>